works uh, later this evening. Um, it will include, you know, the names of the chapters you were to read and of the units in Bridging World History online I want you to look at. Uh, but it will not include all uh, readings that might be assigned, although it will list just the first reading, the one of, from my book on animals. Uh, on Sunday, you will receive notification about sectioning. And uh, that is, say, the, uh, the times and the places of the sections, and it will be first come, first serve. Um, still working out some TA issues, but they should be fixed by then. My section for graduate students is going to be on Thursdays. It wasn't this week. I, sorry, a couple of people misunderstood that. Starting next week, and it will be uh, Thursday from 10 to 11 um, in, in my office in 421, uh, unless there are too many people. So can I have a show of hands? How many graduate students? Once again, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, that, seven, that should uh, easily, not easily, that should be accommodatable within my office. So we'll uh, meet there in 421. Uh, all right, this is the week for chapter one. Chapter one deals with the entire history of the species up to the Neolithic Revolution, and then whips through the Neolithic Revolution to the first supposedly the first river valley civilizations in Mesopotamia and Egypt. Uh, in the last class, I sort of debunked the idea that you could learn anything from big history, but somehow you do have to, uh, to, to think about all the things involved with the peopling of the world over a period of tens of thousands of years, uh, particularly in as much as that time span encompasses a variety of significant climatic shifts that make it very difficult to recover uh, uh, exactly what the experience was like for humans as they moved into new habitats. Uh, there are some things that we can tell from, uh, from bones uh, and from implements. Uh, one of them is that uh, the hominid teeth become smaller and these are primarily the grinding teeth, and this is interpreted as a shift to a diet that does not require so much grinding of hard vegetable matter. Therefore, there's, a, there's been a tentative conclusion that uh, as hominids move out of Africa, they eat more, uh, more soft foods, uh, presumably meat. This is also accompanied by uh, a uh, reduction, apparently, in the extent of the intestinal tract, again, uh, seeming to, uh, to allow for a meat uh, diet. Uh, I know this may come as a disappointment to the vegans in the room who are convinced that, you know, since Adam and Eve did not eat meat, that therefore, <laughs> Um, vegan culture has been the natural uh, paradisical uh, state of humankind. But in fact, we seem to have uh, abundant evidence that tremendous amounts of meat uh, were, were eaten, I say uh, in terms of proportion of the diet. Why would this be the case? Uh, it actually makes a great deal of sense. Uh, if you are stranded in a place that you have never been in before. Uh, let us say, you know, you were on an airplane that came down on an island uh, somewhere in the South Seas that has never been located, and at the end you had to survive. Fortunately, there were pigs there. Um, but, uh, but the question is, what can you eat in the vegetable world? What we know is that big proportion of the plants either you cannot digest or they taste awful 
or they poison you. Uh, a small percentage of them get you high. And therefore, there's abundant reason to keep trying. <laughs> uh, and you really have to, to visualize, particularly for Central and uh, South America, where the number of psychotropic plants identified by pre-Columbian peoples was in the hundreds, you have to imagine, you know, you and you know, you and your roommate going out in the jungle and saying, now I'm gonna eat this leaf, and if I die, say something over my grave, and but if I don't die, and then report back what I ate, and if I don't die, I'll tell you what it was like. And they end up getting I think you have to realize that getting stoned was a major social goal, cultural goal for humans uh, in certain parts of the world over uh, substantial periods of, of time. And in a sense, we're, we're recovering the pristine uh, nature of humankind today. Not, not me, I'm too old. Um, and besides, I'm a tenured professor at Columbia, and I would do something like that. So, um, so, so if you can't just go out and pick up things to eat uh, from trees and root in the ground and so forth, um, what you can do is eat an animal. Uh, almost all flesh is edible. It's one of the curious things about animals. Now, it's true that you want to you know, avoid certain uh, poisonous animals, particularly blowfish, but even there, the fish is good, it's just the poison part of it that's bad. But um, uh, it is likely that when humans spread from one habitat to another, it took time for them to learn what plants they could eat, but they could immediately eat the animals. So one of the uh, things that you can think about is that the the spread of, uh, of hominids to other, to other parts of the world is correlated to some degree with this shift uh, toward, uh, toward meat eating. Then that brings the problem of uh, how do you eat meat? Uh, I used to ask this in my history of domestic animals course. I said, well, how would you go about eating an animal? And you know the football players say, "Well, I, I, I take it by the horns, and I do this, and I break its neck, and say, okay, now you've killed it. Now what do you do? How do you get inside? And once you're inside, what parts do you eat? Uh, you certainly don't chew on muscle. You say, well, the, there are soft parts like eyeballs and uh, testicles and the liver and so forth. And by and large, it seems likely that all the parts that people avoid now are the ones that were preferred." Uh, early on, but even so, um, meat eating probably began more as scavenging uh, the uh, the bodies left by other primates or, or other uh, carnivores, uh, predators, uh, rather than uh, humans going out and killing things on their own. Although, as they move into new habitats, uh, killing on their own becomes um, uh, more and more important if, in fact, they are eating more and more meat. Uh, in the Mesolithic period, where you have uh, fully fledged uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, rather than Neanderthals or other uh, not quite up to date uh, modern forms of humanity. Uh, you have a big increase, I mentioned this last time, in the eating of fish. So you extend the diet, but you extend it uh, toward other animal products. Um, and then over time, you, you learn what plants are edible within your environment. Although for many of the uh, humans who settled in, or who ranged over uh, Europe and uh, Asia, uh, there was very little in the way of edible plant cover. Uh, this was tundra that simply did not have a very broad spectrum of, uh, of edible foods, uh, plant foods. All right. Uh, 
the Neolithic Revolution is the, the introduction, of seemingly, of large-scale consumption of specific, uh, specific plants. As I've said, there's this problem about why it is that uh, that grass seed uh, is the one that seems to have the biggest impact. Uh, this, there, there's no clear answer to this, although one of the answers probably has to do with the number of inches per rainfall that you, uh, that you need for uh, tubers and rhizomes, uh, you know, uh, big, fat, starchy things that grow underground. Uh, most of the edible species require something around 30 inches of rain per year. Uh, whereas um, uh, cereal grains can grow in about eight inches of rain per year. And indeed, the definition of the fertile crescent, which is often uh, used to talk about uh, the first areas, supposedly the first areas of, uh, of grain production, uh, is the, uh, the line of eight inch rainfall that runs um, along the, uh, the highland areas uh, of Israel, up into uh, the coastal areas of Syria, across southern Turkey, and down along the mountains of western Iran. Uh, the, if you had an arid zone, as you have now, in which you had uh, heavy rainfall in tropical areas, and comparatively heavy rainfall in temperate areas much farther north. Uh, let us say uh, you have a lot of rainfall in uh, the Congo and you know, plenty of rainfall in Scotland. But somewhere in between you have a band that's very, very dry. Uh, spreading the, uh, the dependence on crops or on wild plants that are, uh, that are dependent upon substantial rainfall across that zone would be very difficult. So for the, uh, for the temperate nor northern climates, it's not particularly surprising that a seed plant like wheat or barley would be more likely to spread than uh, yams or uh, manioc or uh, something like that. All right, this, uh, this is enough on what is a fairly tedious subject. Um, let me shift to, not from the history of archaeology to the archaeology of history. When history uh, conceptualization gets packaged in the form of books or courses, or simply of received wisdom or documentaries or something like that. It reflects not simply the, the current perceptions of the, uh, of the authors or makers, but it reflects the accumulation of, of uh, discoveries or theories or um, uh, accepted stories that go back for a very long period of time. And of course, the one that we're going to start with here, um, River Valley Civilization in Mesopotamia and Egypt, uh, has a very long history as an area of, of thought. And it has to do with archaeology in the, primarily in the, in the 19th century, but going back to the 18th century when Europeans went to Egypt and the Middle East and started to dig things up and take them home. Uh, they could have gone to the Yucatan and dug up and taken home uh, things from a Mayan um, uh, pyramid, except that it was covered with trees and vines. The nice thing about the Middle East was that there wasn't any nasty ground cover. And so you could see, you know, often when people think of archaeology, they think, oh, an archaeologist went out and he found a mound and he excavated it. 
There are about a million mounds in the Middle East. They're all over the place. You uh, travel along in a car in Iran or uh, Iraq or something, and you see this irregular landscape where you have um, mounds. Presumably, there's something underneath the mountain. There's no trouble finding a mound. The, the trouble is deciding which mound to dig, getting permission to dig it, and uh, putting up with the experience of having there be nothing of interest there. An archaeologist friend of mine who died a number of years back said that throughout his career he felt he was always about three feet away from becoming world famous. Uh, that if he just dug a little bit differently he would have found the earliest something. Uh, inscribed plaque, something like that. He never found it. He was a very distinguished archaeologist, but he never made the big find. And he said that the amazing thing is that some archaeologists may, may have made the big find again and again and again. And the question of why some people were successful um, and others were journeymen, uh, you know, it, it raises questions. I was in Iran in 1971, and uh, I wanted to go out and search for long forgotten buried Buddhist monasteries, which may have existed, I don't know. I never, <laughs> I never found any, I had a theory, but uh, I had a good friend who, you know, an army, a US Army intelligence who had leave time and a government truck and so we went out camping in the desert, going to villages looking for the stuff, and we were driving along. And he said, well, what are we going to be looking for? I said, we're looking for mounds. He said, yeah, well, what, what does that mean? He said, well, it'll be a, a pile of earth that doesn't fit. It's, he said, well, let's, next time you see one, let's stop. He said, no, no, we're still hundreds of miles from where we're going. So we have it, it's my car, and I'm driving. So when you see a mound, uh, let's stop. So uh, only about two, three hours from Tehran on a, a fairly major road, not the most major road, but sort of the second road, I said, okay, there's a mound that's really close to the road, like, you know, 30 meters off the highway. So let's stop. And so we walk over to the, to the mound and we're looking around. And, um, and I pick up this. This is a five-pointed uh, star pecked out of apparently granite. Um, has no hole in the center, but it is exactly the shape of a uh, fourth millennium BC mace head, except that the mace head should have a hole in the center. So you could put a, you know, a stick of it and make it a, a club. Uh, in the last 30 years, I have not found any archaeologist who can tell me what this is. Um, there was pottery there that was appeared to me to be around 2000 BC. You know, sort of, yeah, 2000 <laughs> BC. That, that must be about right. But it was you know, hand-thrown, straw-tempered, bitumen-lined pottery. And, um, and there it was, it was a mound. It may have been a very, very early mound, or may not. But what are you going to do? Um, of course, you can put this in your pocket and take it away and violate Iranian antiquities laws. <laughs> uh, so this is an illegal uh, theft from the, uh, from the Iranian people. On the other hand, the Iranian uh, publishers ignore international royalty, international copyright <laughs> law. So they translate my books without paying a royalty, and I steal their, their stone star uh, in violation of their law. So I have no, I have no negative conscience in all this. But, but the point is that there are, there are lots and lots of sites
uh, in the last 30 or 40 years, uh, fewer and fewer sites have been dug and more have simply been, uh, been surveyed. And uh, survey work has been very enlightening because it helps you choose which one to dig. And there are a number of theories, particularly central place theory, uh, that uh, give you ways to uh, try and analyze what are the places you should dig and what are the places uh, that would be less relevant. Uh, but of course, then you have to have permission. Now, in the 19th century, uh, you simply went and you stole whatever you found. Uh, you got permission from a governor, perhaps, uh, but you took whole temples off to European museums uh, and so on. An archaeologist, uh, more or less my contemporary in Iran, told me that there was a village in Iran where he had uh, examined a, uh, uh, an Akkadian inscription on a stone. Very rare to find Akkadian inscriptions in the Iranian highlands. Uh, and the villager said that a couple of years earlier, uh, some Japanese and a Range Rover, Rover had come to the village and ordered the villagers to put the stone in the truck. And the villager said no, so the Japanese drove off. But, you know, at 100 years earlier, that would have worked. They could have taken it back to Tokyo. It would be a nice museum there. Uh, the result is that where the excavations are done is a function of the politics, the, uh, the geography, the degree of safety for people working in a particular area, and that all converged very nicely upon Egypt and Mesopotamia. Uh, and lo and behold, um, where you were able to dig most easily is where you end up deciding civilization started. Now, this has become an irony, because one of the great problems of the master narrative that dates the beginning of civilization to Egypt and Mesopotamia as the people in Egypt and Mesopotamia were not European white people. Um, this this is, was a big problem back in the 19th century because uh, racialist theories of superior and inferior peoples were, uh, were very widespread and had a big popular following. And indeed, one of the products of, of this was a distinction between uh, on the part of certain archaeologists between uh, people who lived in the Tigris and Euphrates Valley in Iraq whom they thought were white and people living in Egypt who just didn't seem as white as the people in Iraq. So they came up with the theory that white people from Iraq came to the Nile Valley and brought civilization with them uh, in their grip. It, um, and you had quite a bit written on this question of a so-called uh, uh, conquering white race of civilized uh, people who went different places. This is also when they thought they went from Greece to England to tell people to build Stonehenge, that sort of thing. Uh, all of this racialist stuff has pretty much been uh, been discarded, but the narrative of Western civilization has still been uh, burdened uh, by, the, by the idea that the origins of civilization that we see as the roots of our Western civilization date, you know, go back to parts of the world that we no longer include in our Western civilization, namely Egypt and Iraq. Uh, wouldn't it have been better if the earliest civilization had been in Europe? You know, how cool would that be? Then the Europeans could say, you know, we're at the origin point of civilization. Now that happens to be true. Uh, it appears that, let's say, if you go back to um, 4000 BC or 3800 BC, which is a good 500 years 
before the earliest things that we call uh, cities in Iraq, uh, the beginnings of Sumerian civilization, the largest human settlement in the world uh, apparently was in Romania, um, made up entirely of gymnasts. It's amazing. Now, it, was, it, was, it was in Romania, uh, very much in the valley, not of the Tigris and Euphrates or of the Nile, but of the Danube River. And this civilization, uh, uh, you know, you, you had one community there that uh, is estimated to have had 5,000 inhabitants, about double the size of the Sumerian uh, cities when they come to be built. Uh, and in sort of uh, great arcs of houses that seem to be organized in a certain form. Um, but this wasn't known back when the, when the theory was being established. Now, this civilization is recognized and it is called Old Europe. You will not find any reference to Old Europe in chapter one of the Earth and its peoples. Uh, not my fault that I didn't draft that chapter, but our ancient historian uh, felt that, you know, how do you tell the story of the great river valley civilizations that give rise to civilization if you have to start with Romania? Because the civilization in Romania, uh, old Europe, is dead by 3500 BC. Instead of it going on and giving rise to empires and codes of law and religions and so forth and so on, it began, it flourished, it ended. And it was in a river valley, uh, which, which is very, you know, raises a great problem because the, the standard narrative requires the reader to believe that uh, civilization, uh, once it starts, is kind of self-propagating. And you can see it spread, and you can see it uh, increase in complexity. So what was going on in old Europe, and why didn't we know? Well, of course, when you go back to the 19th century, and you look at the areas that were involved, which were primarily uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and uh, uh, the southern most parts of Ukraine, uh, this was a very unsettled and warlike period. It was a period of the decline of the Ottoman Empire, uh, rise of very parochial nationalisms among the various uh, peoples of Southeast Europe. It really wasn't a good time to simply go out with a shovel and start digging up in someone's village um, so that was one reason, perhaps, that people never noticed this civilization. Uh, there would also be the question of, if you found something, how did you get permission to, to take it to your museum? Uh, because who, who was the government? The government. And that could be a problem. It turns out that uh, old Europe was not suspected to exist as a civilization until the Soviet period. You know, following uh, World War II. Between the end of World War II and the end of the, uh, of the Soviet Union, there was a massive archaeological enterprise in Southeast Europe Russia, southern Russia and Ukraine to dig up mounds. There are zillions of mounds in that area, uh, just like the Middle East, but they hadn't been dug up before. Uh, there, you know, there wasn't any, um, any tradition that there had once been a civilization there. And when they were dug up, uh, the findings were published in Russian and Romanian and published by local academies of sciences in uh, books and articles that were not read by Western archaeologists. They also 
were books and articles that were predicated upon uh, Marxist theories of the development of human society, which were very different from those that prevailed among Western archaeologists. So when the Soviet Union fell, there was a particular uh, time and place where a handful of archaeologists were invited from Russia to come to an archaeological convention in the United States and to talk about what they and their colleagues have been doing for the last two generations. And lo and behold, they said, we have found a civilization that is uh, uh, incredibly complex uh, and that has the oldest layers uh, going back to well before uh, parallel um, developments that you have in Egypt and in Mesopotamia. Uh, but it came to an end. Even then, uh, this did not have the impact that it might have had if all the writings had, uh, had been translated into Western languages. There simply weren't that many archaeologists working in the West who could read Russian excavation reports. You also had to have the freedom to go to the site and go to the museums and look at the collections. So it is only now that the, uh, the, the great accumulation of archaeological knowledge from the Soviet era is being melded into the thinking of, of European archaeologists. Uh, one of the leading um, centers for, uh, for publicizing this is the Center for the Study of the Ancient World at NYU, and they had an exhibition last spring of uh, the archaeology of old Europe and um, a number of publications uh, related to that. This, is run, this center is run by our former colleague here at Columbia, Roger Bagnall. Uh, but the, the easiest place to get access to this is a book by David Anthony called uh, was it called the name that David Anthony gave it? <laughs> uh, hor uh, language, horses, Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll get it for you, and Nathan will email it to you. Um, it's a stunning book, because it, it, it tells you that everything you thought you knew about uh, the beginnings of civilization has to be modified. How long it will take for it to trickle down into textbooks, I don't know. But when it does, it will raise the question, of um, why uh, the, the growth of dense human settlements based on grain, on grain agriculture did not succeed in perpetuating itself in Southeast Europe while it did in Egypt and, and Mesopotamia. Not only that, but it turns out that while old Europe has roots that go back, or outshoot, offshoots, I should say, that go up the Danube River toward uh, t further into Europe. As you move east across the, uh, the northern edge of the Black Sea, let's say, here, here's the Black Sea. And here's the Caspian Sea. Here's the Caucasus Mountains. You've got a little connection here. And here's the Aegean Sea that connects to the Mediterranean Sea. Um, there are great, great issues having to do with this, with this area. Uh, one of them is the hydrology of the area. Um, the Danube flows into the Black Sea. Then the Dniester flows into the Black Sea. Then the Boog, then the, uh, the Dnieper, uh, then the Don, and you have a whole bunch. And then over here, you have the Volga and the Ural. These rivers 
flow from north to south acro uh, across Central Asia and Russia and Ukraine and empty into the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. That was not always the case. It appears that when you go back to, uh, to glacial times, when Northern Europe was buried under, um, under vast quantities of ice, uh, these rivers didn't flow in this direction. It's when you get the melting of the ice, which is around 12,000 BC, the last ice age, that the, the weight of the ice as it melts, uh, the disappearance of that weight allows the, the land to uh, sort of spring back. And so these rivers start to flow into the Black Sea and the Caspian uh, in larger amounts. But during the Ice Age, uh, the, the sea level fell so much that the Black Sea was not connected with the world's oceans. And in fact, the Black Sea uh, appears to have been uh, a, very, a fairly shallow lake. Uh, if you go back further into the Ice Ages, you'll find that the Mediterranean Sea was almost dry. Uh, when you look at cross sections of the Nile Valley, you, you see that you know, here you have the Nile flows in the Mediterranean, but if you look at the cross section, you find that at one time, instead of flowing into the sea here, it was flowing through a very deep canyon to get down to the level of the Mediterranean Sea because the Mediterranean Sea was almost dry. And what you have now, places like Cyprus and Crete, Sicily, islands in the Mediterranean were once mountaintops. Uh, and, it, and it helps explain why you have certain species of animals that get isolated on these islands and um, are left over from the time when you could walk across the area that becomes the Mediterranean Sea. So you get like dwarf elephants in Cyprus. Uh, elephants that were stranded on what became an island and gradually became, uh, you know, three or four feet tall instead of uh, 12 feet tall. Um, but that was, that was long, long ago. The issue of the Mediterranean and the, and the Black Sea may go back to around 5000 BC. In other words, within the same very broad uh, time horizon of when the old European uh, uh, civilization came into being. And you have different theories. Uh, two scholars at the Lamont Doherty uh, Earth Observatory, uh, the Columbia uh, Center for Studying uh, Oceanography and, uh, you know, all aspects of geology that's located across the river just north of the George Washington Bridge. Uh, two scholars there, uh, Pittman and his colleague, uh, the gentleman who's not Pittman, um, they wrote a book called Noah's Flood. See, I, I remember some titles. Um, uh, Noah's Flood says that sometime around maybe 5500 BC, um, the something happened that allowed the water from the Aegean and the Mediterranean to break through at this level and to fill the Black Sea. And their argument is that that great uh, filling of the bathtub is what came in legend to be called Noah's Flood. Because at the time that the Black Sea was filling up, on the northern edges of the Black Sea, you had people who were growing wheat and barley on, uh, on low-lying uh, low land, and they gradually were flooded out, and they all had to leave. Uh, there's a very controversial uh, thesis. You have some people who hold to it very strongly on a number of technical grounds and some people who dispute it on technical grounds. You have a similar argument saying that 
uh, something here called the Caspian Depression. At one point, the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea were, uh, were linked together, and then the sea levels changed, and the link between them disappeared. So there's a lot of controversy. Unlike the Nile, where there is broad agreement that that is the river, and that's where the river has been, and that's where the river is going to stay, and uh, you could pretty much count on there being a Nile River there. It doesn't mean that there weren't other rivers uh, in North Africa. It's just that all the others dried up and only the Nile uh, survived. If you, the dryness of North Africa, the dryness of the Sahara Desert, reached at the maximum at which it is still situated around 2500 BC. Before that, it was moister and uh, and, and instead of having desert from Egypt to the Atlantic Ocean, you had grassland and in some areas probably uh, uh, savanna forest. If you fly over the Sahara Desert, you can see the river valleys in the most dramatic way. You can say, ah, there was a great waterfall. There's where two rivers flow together. And what you see now is simply rivers of sand. The water has all disappeared. But the Nile, because it connected with water sources in Central Africa, the Nile survived. Same thing with the Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, the Tigris and Euphrates uh, have been there, uh, changing their beds somewhat over uh, thousands of years. But by and large, they have been there uh, all the way along. And the water there unlike in the Nile, where it comes from Central Africa, the water there comes from the snowfall in Turkey that melts and flows into the Tigris and the Euphrates valleys that go through uh, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, and end up in the Persian Gulf. Now, that hydrology, in other words, is one where you can say, we know where the rivers were, and we can see the whole area getting drier over time. But up here, it's, it's, it's controversial. You know, what constituted a, uh, a river system or an agricultural system along a lake? Um, was the water in the lake, uh, you know, sweet water or saline? Uh, what is the, the, the situation there? Uh, the linkage between uh, old Europe and the broad hydrology uh, of the region hasn't really been uh, been thoroughly worked out at this time. However, um, old Europe is from here over, and to say from the Don River uh, to the you know, westward. None of that uh, wheat and barley cultivation extends over here. And when you get uh, over here, Central Asia, east of the Volga River and the Ural River, uh, you don't even get any people to speak up. I mean, it's uh, very, just foragers. Um, so there was a clustering in this direction in where these various river valleys were. And that is where uh, the old European civilization is located. Now, as I say, if, if this had been known in the 19th century, uh, European historians fixated upon the history of Western civilization would have said civilization began with white Europeans in Romania and was borrowed by the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians who really weren't quite white enough to qualify as Europeans. This kind of thinking is linked to a um, to a, uh, a, a school of theorizing uh, known as diffusionism. Diffusionism is based on the idea that it is more likely that something will happen once and spread than that it will happen in a similar or identical fashion in different places uh, that are not connected with each other. 
one of the, is one of the great areas of, of controversy, both in archaeology and in history, is what do you do when you see a phenomenon that occurs in different areas? Uh, the diffusionists usually say that there must be a single point of origin and that everything spreads from there. This is really why we have this, uh, this concept of Western Civ starting in Egypt and Mesopotamia is that the earliest place has to be the place from which everything else spread. Uh, we don't, you know, it is not used methodically. In other words, uh, if you take much more recent things, you can say, oh, the, um, uh, the computer uh, was invented in the West and s diffused from the West to transform the rest of the world. But then when you say, well, gunpowder was invented in China and diffused from China to the rest of the world, then you say the really important thing isn't where gunpowder was invented, it's what the people who borrowed it did with it. Uh, because, again, there's an effort to sort of give special attention and special uh, primacy to what uh, the Europeans did. But when you go to this earlier period, uh, diffusionism is a very, um, uh, you know, a very difficult um, issue to deal with. Some things clearly diffused. Uh, and the most obvious ones are plants and animals that show up in geographical spaces where they are not indigenous. Uh, they had to get there somehow. And if those plants and animals are domestic, the presumption is that they came in conjunction with humans. So um, horses are not native to China, are not native to uh, the Middle East, uh, are not uh, native to Southeast Asia. Um, but they show up in those places. And so you can talk about the diffusion of horse culture in some sense. Uh, similarly, uh, wheat and barley are not native to northern China. The grains initially uh, you know, grown there were um, local grains, uh, foxtail millet and uh, pearl millet, um, not wheat and barley, but they come there. So you can look at products that move from one place to another. And there's a great deal of, of scholarship devoted to this movement of uh, plants and animals. On the other hand, in the area of domestication, the, uh, the tendency now is to argue that certain species are domesticated in more than one place. Now, it's, it's an argument. You, you can't prove it very well. You can, you can prove through uh, DNA analysis that, let us say, all dogs belong to the same species. Uh, but there's a huge argument over whether uh, all dogs descend from, uh, you know, from Adam dog and Eve dog, who were first, you know, brought as puppies into the house by, you know, um, some caveman. Uh, dogs are problematic. Um, were they domestic, did they become domestic in several different locales or in one? And if in one, why do the, why does the function of dogs seem to differ? There is very little support for the idea that dogs, uh, you know, become domestic animals um, because they help in hunting. Uh, this is the standard notion when you have the idea that hunters go to herders. Uh, now that generally is not accepted. Some people would argue that dogs were, became domestic because uh, they were good to eat. And in certain parts of the world, um, dog is really um, 
a choice food. You know, the dog restaurants in Korea were under great pressure at the time of the World Cup there because you had the, the globalists in Korea saying, we have to close the dog restaurants because it'll gross out you know, everyone else. And the Koreans saying, no, no, our national pride demands that we keep the dog restaurants open. Well, you, know, you can still get dog in Korea. It's supposed to be very, very good. I haven't had any. But, um, and nobody suggested that you know, there should be dietary changes in any other part of the world because of the World Cup or the Olympics or something of that sort. But, but we don't know about dogs. Um, cats, another problematic animal. Unlike dogs, there is a fairly strong argument that's made that cats were domesticated in, became domestic in one place, probably Egypt. And not a terribly long time ago, the number of uh, chromosomal differences that you have in cats from wild cat, from the most closely related wild cat to the domestic cat is negligible. Um, with both dogs and cats, you have a theory that uh, is called self-domestication, which maintains that under certain circumstances, some animals will seek out living with humans. Those circumstances are primarily related to, uh, first, in the case of dogs, to all of the leftover food from the animals that the humans killed in the Paleolithic, the Mesolithic period. That there were just you know, heaps of you know, juicy bones that the humans really couldn't eat very well. You know, as long, and, and you could just go there and eat those bones, like a bear going to a garbage dump. And if the humans thought you were dangerous, they would kill you and eat you. But if they thought you were safe, uh, they would let you stay because you were policing up the campsite. That's theory of self-domestication for, for dogs. Nobody knows whether it's correct or not. Self-domestication for cats maintains that in Egypt, perhaps elsewhere, but Egypt is the most likely, um, when you had grain uh, agriculture, people started to collect large quantities of grain and store it. And where they stored large quantities of grain, they attracted large quantities of mice. And where they had large quantities of mice, they had large quantities of cats, because the cats preferred to eat the mice over anything else. So they didn't say, let's live in this human encampment. They said, let's live in Mausopolis, you know. Let's just go in there like Godzilla and eat every mouse we, we can find because they're just scurrying around all over the place and we're, we're the cats, we eat mice. Now, the humans, as hypothetically with the dogs, um, would kill the cats if they thought they were dangerous. You know, scratch my baby, I brain you. you know, that, but if the, if the cat was, uh, was docile, um, they would uh, permit it to live because it was clearing out the mice. And this gets into the crucial issue of the definition of what is a domestic animal, and which I've talked about in, in, in what I've assigned for you to read. Uh, by my definition, a domestic animal is an animal that belongs to a population of a given species uh, in which you have uh, docility inherited from generation to generation. It has nothing to do with taming animals or you know, getting puppies or cubs and raising them uh, among humans. It has to be inherited so that you go from generation to generation, and each generation is, uh, is docile. And the way that occurs in the experimental uh, studies that have been done in the 20th century is that if you take a population of wild animals and you force them to hang around with people so that there are people over the place or put in a cage in a lab or something like that, most of the wild animals 
uh, will not be able to have sex. They'll just be too anxious. You know, they, oh, who's looking? You know, oh, geez, I, you know, there's Bob again looking. You know, they, uh, they just won't do it. So, you know, experiment in the uh, early 20th century um, took a, a hundred rats. Eighty percent of them did not reproduce because their fight or flight reaction with respect to to reproduction was so high that they were agitated all the time. And the only ones that reproduced were the sort of stoners, the, the laid back rats said, oh, all right, Bob, you know, cool. I'll watch you too. Uh, um, you know, it, you know, the next generation had a higher proportion of those that had the laid back fight or flight reactions because most of the parents were in that subset of the natural distribution of, uh, of hormonal uh, stimuli. Um, by the time you get to 20 or 30 generations, you have a population that has uh, adrenaline glands that are 75% smaller than those of the wild population. And they no longer run away, they no longer become startled, they no longer have any difficulty reproducing, they are docile. And interestingly enough, they look different. This has not been fully analyzed, but there are certain that as you change the hormonal balance, there are certain physical changes that, that occur. Uh, one of them is albinism, that almost all domestic animals uh, in the early stages of domestication start to have white spots here and there, like on the forehead or something like that. Um, a pig, a cow, a horse, a dog, a white blaze on the forehead is an early, uh, uh, appears to be associated with domestication. Uh, pure white animals, uh, some of them of course, like polar bears, are obviously environmentally influenced, but pure white animals are more likely than not to be domestic. So uh, domestic rabbits are white, wild rabbits are not. Domestic uh, geese are white, wild geese are not. Domestic ducks are white, wild ducks are not. Donald duck is domestic, Daffy duck is wild. Uh, uh, it's, you know, and, and one of the big challenges to, to Disney, whatever happened to the white mice? I mean, here you had Mickey, and he was black, and somehow they should have gotten white mice into that story, but they never did. Anyway, um, so, the development of, uh, of a domestic population has more to do with the uh, continuous breeding over numerous generations in a particular uh, locale or restricted area in which the, the most wild offspring were killed or driven away and the most docile ones were kept until you had a population that was essentially all docile. And this seems to apply to a whole bunch of animals, although it may have come about in different ways according to different specific uh, species. But the thing is, it's not the fusion. Um, the, the older work done with domesticating animals, as with plants, said that once somebody figured out how to, uh, how to domesticate an animal, then they could go and domesticate another animal. Of course, they never did figure out how to domesticate an animal. You, let's say you have domestic, a domestic cow, and you think of 30 generations, you say, gee, 300 years ago, that was a wild cow. Good thing we kept careful records. Well. <laughs> Uh, it, it was a puzzle because, of course, they didn't keep careful as they didn't know what was happening. Domestication, in most cases, I believe, is an unanticipated outcome that isn't even recognized necessarily when it has occurred. Um, 
There are other theories. Um, Levi Strauss, for example, a famous structuralist anthropologist, maintained that prior to the Neolithic Revolution, uh, humans had a scientific spirit and were avid uh, experimentalists. And they, but they simply experimented with keeping animals and crossbreeding them just to see what happened. And then as soon as they got a domestic animal, then they quit being scientists and they became you know, barbecue mavens. They, you know, uh, he, he argued that there was a primitive uh, scientific mentality that disappears in the Neolithic and does not reappear until the modern scientific revolution. I think that's wrong, but Levi Strauss is very famous, so what can I do? Uh, I won't you know, be as harsh on him as I will on Jared Diamond, who you know, Manders has got almost everything wrong. Um, OK, so you have this, this problem of diffusionism. Uh, we have a master narrative that says that um, the uh, wheat and barley begin to be uh, dom uh, uh, domesticated wheat and barley show up in the Nile Valley and Mesopotamia, and they spread from there. If you go to the website for Jared Diamond's books, uh, book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, you will actually have an animated map that will show here's where wheat and barley start and they spread. And here's where potatoes start. So that, no, no potatoes, no yams, no corn, no anything, just wheat and barley, because that's the whole story. Um, diffusionism is not nonsense, but it has to be uh, you know, looked at very carefully. When it comes to the question of old Europe, this is a, uh, a hot debate. One of the um, dominant theories about the end of old Europe by one of the first archaeologists to, uh, to show that this had been a uh, dynamic civilization by 4000 BC, uh, Maria Jimbutas, she said that this civilization was destroyed by horse riding, um, mace wielding, uh, you know, chariot driving uh, warriors from, from the east. Um, and of course there's a corollary that old Europe is seen in this theory as being uh, matriarchal, that because we have you know, many, many little figurines, thousands of little figurines of, of pregnant or at least overweight uh, females, and then we stop having those. So it's the idea that the beastly, you know, heavily armed, testosterone driven men and their chariots and horses came in and destroyed the peace loving. Uh, matriarchal women of Southeast Europe who had actually created civilization and then they, it got stolen from them because that's just what men do. You know, they're, they're just beastly. Um, well, uh, you know, David Anthony, who's written the, uh, the book, the name of which I can't remember, um, goes into this argument in quite some detail because he's particularly interested in the origin of uh, of these horse riders and uh, chariot drivers, and particularly of the relation of uh, horse riding and chariot driving uh, to the Indo-European languages. And this goes into another um, chapter in this sort of big history uh, story of uh, you have archaeology, uh, you have a um, uh, study of bones, of implements, of climate change, and you have language. And this is one of the hardest things to, to deal with in a world historical context because to study language um, kind of 
means you have to know some language. And generally, uh, we can make no assumptions about foreign languages. In particular, there is a question of when does language arise and um, why does it get divided up uh, geographically and by social group in the way that it comes to be divided up? Oh, I know, okay, Tower of Babel, um, <laughs> that explains it all. Uh, but it, it, it really is a, uh, a problem, and it's a problem that relates to not simply um, the, the surviving evidence of language and language difference, but also to scientific theories about how language comes to be produced. Now, here, um, the, the most controversial uh, argument uh, has been that, uh, that syntax, the ability to link uh, sounds together in a meaningful fashion, uh, which is seen to be uh, you know, essential to define a language. That syntax uh, comes about because of a uh, genetically established capacity of the human brain that no other animal has. And this is the idea of a syntax gene or a language gene. Uh, Noam Chomsky is the uh, primary author of this theory. who was almost unquestionably the most famous and um, brilliant American uh, scholar of linguistics before he switched to, uh, to left-wing polemic writing, uh, where he is now America's perhaps foremost and most brilliant writer of left-wing polemics. Uh, but nevertheless, Chomsky's notion of the language gene um, encountered the question of the physical capacity to, to, create, to, to create language. In other words, the, the great apes uh, who are our closest relatives do not have a physical capacity to, uh, to create linguistic sounds uh, or modulate them in their throat or their lips and so forth to, to create speech. So at some point, you have a physical capacity that comes into being. And according to Chomsky, at some point, you have a, uh, a genetic capacity to make use of the physical capacity. Now, one could argue that the physical capacity to make the sounds must have come first, because it would be sort of silly to have a syntax gene and say, you know, I really want to recite the Iliad now, if you couldn't make the sounds. So, uh, so I had a conversation with um, one of our anthropologists who's made his reputation on uh, studies of the brain and the physiology of the, of the skull. And, um, and we talked about this, and he said, well, chimpanzees can have the physical capacity to hum. Have the physical capacity to hum, but they don't. And, and that was sort of interesting. You know, you go, mm-hmm, 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 bananas, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, but they don't choose to. As if he was saying, you know, there was a physical capacity, but the, the will wasn't there. Then you get to the debate over Neanderthals that you know, humans from before 40,000 uh, BC, could they speak? And you get disagreements on that. Um, one of the uh, interesting uh, findings of archeology span in Neolithic and uh, Neanderthal sites uh, has been a small number of flutes. First there was one, then two, now there have been several. Uh, these are uh, bones 
that are perforated with the perforations spaced in such a way that you could play it as a flute. Initially,